All right. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, Eddie Curran. And those who are watching as well. I think we have, we have a little technical difficulty. Uh, yeah, we got uh, Matthew's doing our behind the scenes right now. Um, mm -hmm. Since Travis is out and I'm on the panel. So I think we might be good. Oh, you hear that, uh, that uh, static? Hey, Christina. Hey, daughter. What's up? What's up? Hey, those who are watching right now, we are, uh, if we're live streaming. Okay. Uh, uh, hey, um, Matthew, on the back, you got us live right now. Can you uh, take us out? And those who are watching as we are working us out, just uh, be patient. We'll be right there with you. Good morning, happy Sabbath. It's real time this morning. All right. So as to Elder Wilson's point, I think some of you guys see us live right now, um, <laughs> which is okay. You know, these things happen here. Uh, I'm going to ask our technician in the back, if you don't mind, I don't know if Dr. Wells is in the, in the studio, if you could let her in. And if you can go ahead and share your screen from the from Proclaim, yep. And then we're going to let you go ahead and, and stream us off, and we're just going to get started at that point. That sounds good. Yeah, Happy Sabbath morning, Sister Doris Viola. Oh, we're in the background. Okay. Okay, you know what? We're just gonna go ahead and get started. Um, we're gonna do a little bit different since we're kind of ran into some technical difficulties. So I'm gonna ask our um, our technician back there if you can just go ahead and um, change the format for us so that we can show all the participants. Yeah. Okay, and I think Dr. Howell, you were on. Yeah, we're gonna bring you in, and then um, Dr. Wells, if you can hear me, um, they're saying that your video video isn't on but you've been added to the stream i don't go. know if you want to remove yourself yes, yeah. and there we go yes, all right all right so so good morning everyone uh, a little a little different today um but you know what god is still good and we are streaming so we don't get the wonderful countdown but that's all right uh, we want to say welcome to our Sabbath School program for today. Um, my name is uh, Cecil Curran, and I'm an elder here at Shiloh SDA Church, and I have the privilege of facilitating our panel today. And we have three wonderful panelists that's going to be uh, providing the word today from the uh, Sabbath School lesson that's entitled Struggling with All Energy. I don't know about you, panel, but this week's lesson was wonderful. I, I ran into some parts that convicted me uh, when I was reading this week. And we're just excited about it. So, you know, we're going to give our panelists a couple of seconds here to introduce themselves. And I'm going to go from the upper left-hand corner on my screen, which is Dr. Christina Wells. Good morning, everyone. It's nothing like doing a show live. So <laughs> you got to come with all that. I'm Christina <laughs> Wells, and I'm the health ministry leader for the Shiloh Seventh-day Adventist Church. And you know what? I know it's Satan doesn't want us to do this lesson because he knows it's powerful. It's powerful. But but God is always in control. We're going to struggle and endure through it. Happy Sabbath, everyone. Hey, man. Thank you, Dr. Wells. We're going to go next to the our, our next doctor on the panel, Dr. Janelle Howe. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. <clears throat> uh, I'm excited to be here. My name is Janelle. I I uh, attend Shiloh SDA Church here in Chicago, and I'm excited. You know, it's a really uh, important and relevant lesson that I think is going to help a lot of people. So 
I'm excited for you all to converse with us. All right, amen. Thank you, Dr. Howland. Last but certainly not least, we're going to turn it over to Elder Jose Wilson. Hey, good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Jose Wilson, and I am uh, an elder at Shiloh, and I've been at Shiloh since 1997 in the house representing uh, old school, OGs, and all of that, all rolled up in one. And we're so excited about the um, the lesson started today. And, and just real quick, you know, I thought it was you hit it. And so for those who are watching live and those who watch watching rebroadcast, man, we know this lesson is so powerful. Uh, right now, I'm nursing my granddaughter who tested positive for COVID, and, uh, and also my daughter uh, who tested positive for COVID. So, you know, I still test a negative, man, but still, man, just know that uh, God is good, and, and they're both, uh, they have symptoms, but are recovering uh, well. So looking forward to, uh, we're in a different kind of cruise for this morning, uh, Elder Cecil, but God is good, brother. Hey, man, you're absolutely right. You know, we, we find crucibles that, like, Dr. Will said earlier, you go live, anything can happen, but that's right. The Holy Spirit is with us. For those who are watching, um, and if you needed a copy of the Sabbath School lesson, if you don't have one, feel free to go open up a browser, um, go to absg.adventist.org. That's asbg.adventist.org. You can download a copy or stop by your local Seventh day Adventist church, and you can feel free to uh, grab a copy there. We do have a few people that's uh, in the chat already this morning, so we want to say good morning to all of those who have dropped in and said hello. Um, we're going to go ahead and get started first with a word of prayer, and I'm going to ask um, Dr. Howell, would you mind praying for us to get started? Yeah, Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for this Sabbath day. Thank you for an opportunity to rest, relax, be spiritually rejuvenated, Lord. I ask that you would guide the conversation, that the character of Christ will really shine through this lesson, and we may understand how you are helping us and what our job is when it comes to our salvation and our walk with you, dear Father. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Our memory text for today um, is found in Colossians chapter 1, verse 29. And this is actually from the NIV version that's quoted for this week. Again, it's Colossians chapter 1, verse 29, and it reads, To this end, I strenuously contend with all the energy Christ so powerfully works in me and as we may mention earlier our um lesson is entitled struggling with all energy you know and when i was preparing for this one especially for the sabbath afternoon one you know there's there's three points that we're going to get out of the the lesson for the week um he has actually uh, can you go back and put that one up I, I wanted to actually talk about that one that that image i don't know if you guys ever looked at the images for each week and, and this this quarter is a little different and I looked at this and I was like, wow, you know, this could be interpreted a couple of different ways. But I actually see a person, maybe a, a female because of the long hair, but I don't want to be judgmental. But somebody who is struggling to hold on to the cross and they have all this fire around them. Right. And, and it's like, I need to hold on because if not, I'm going to get consumed. To me, I think this week's image just kind of gives the thought of perseverance, you know, that struggle that you have. You know, while you're just really trying to hold on with all your might, all your energy, you know, in this case to uh, get past all of the doubts, all the fears that could be represented by the flames, just the struggles of life, you know, during the different trials here. So I, this week's image was a little different. I was just like, wow, you know, it's not only a struggle, but it's like survival. Um, when, when we look at the, the week's lesson, there's three points that we're going to be looking at. Um three major themes. One is going to be the role of truth in overcoming crucibles, right? You know, we need to know why things happen and, and whose side do we choose to stand on and why? The second thing that we're probably going to be looking at this week as well is our role of, of having free will and overcoming crucibles. You know, God empowers us. He calls us to partner with them to exercise our free will and collaborate Him with him in the great work of salvation. And then the third one is the commitment and the, the perseverance in overcoming crucibles. You know, we, we, we can't serve two masters. You know, we either, um, we have to be on one side or the other. We can't collaborate with two. So, I mean, I'm looking forward to this, our, our Sabbath afternoon program. Um, text message itself just focuses on, you know, how do we as Christians, you know, 
have that change that's needed, you know, to, to be mature during the crucibles of life as they come on. So I'm going to open up to the, the panel right now just to share your thoughts on our, our uh, initial thoughts on the lesson, um, along with just the Sabbath uh, afternoon uh, part of the, uh, the program. You know, since I was thinking that um, uh, how apropos that that picture is, the image that you you shared earlier, and that is uh, on the cover of this particular um, day, and the person really hanging on the cross, man. I think that uh, for me this week in particular, it's just been very much. You know, there have been point there there have been points in time through the week where that's how I felt. You know, and so and so I think that you know the lesson for me was encouraging because I think it was just a reminder that uh, things will get tough, sometimes tougher than we can ever even imagine. But that by holding on to that cross, man, that and believing that the outcome is really secure for us, um, it gives us hope. And that hope is enough fuel to keep you pressing forward. Amen. Yeah, I was going to add, you know, this morning is a perfect example of a crucible and how we can get distracted when we're in the midst of crucibles. And many times when we're in the midst of a crucible, we start to dwell on the problem instead of the problem solver. You know, I was sitting over here thinking like, this, this stream is not right this morning, what's going on? And instead of me focusing <laughs> on the, the one who's gonna get us through this broadcast, right? That's what happens. We become so overwhelmed and it, it changes our perspective. And on Sabbath's lesson, it was interesting. They told the story about two people, you know, one was able to forgive and one wasn't able to forgive. And I, I looked up this, this quote, I found this quote that says, to forgive is to set a prisoner free and discover that the prisoner was you. And so remembering that forgiveness is something we do to ourselves and not to other people. And it's not, you know, the person in the story, they're not saying that what happened to their child was okay, but they're saying that what you did won't control me. It won't control my outlook. It won't control my destiny. And so when we're struggling in the crucible, we have to remember to place our perspective in the right place. And we have to remember to place it on the problem solver and not on ourselves and our situations. Amen. Yeah, I think, you know, I think the lesson is really encouraging because, you know, just the title alone, struggling with all energy. I think sometimes we look at our situations and we think that the struggle is a bad thing. Like, oh, I'm struggling to overcome or I'm struggling my walk with Christ right now. But the problem is not really the struggle. What I got from the lessons that we need to struggle a little harder. And many times it's like almost a passive struggle. It's like I fell into that again and oh, I'm struggling with this. Meanwhile, you're not even really struggling with all your might. And so to me, this lesson is a reminder that we're going to have that struggle. There is a fight, right? There is this controversy going on. And Satan's not going out without putting all his effort in. And so we're going to feel that struggle. And, and we should. Um, and so I think that it's great to learn that we don't have to look at our struggle as a bad thing. We just have to make sure that we're struggling with all our energy, that we're really putting everything into it. And I think from that angle, it becomes a positive thing. Amen. Amen. We're going to move on to our Sunday's lesson, which was entitled The Spirit of Truth. Um, that lesson actually had quoted John um, chapter 16, verses 5 through 15, but in particular, it highlighted John 16, 13, um, where it had called the Holy Spirit the spirit of truth. And we know in some previous verses earlier, it actually mentioned that that the Holy Spirit is a helper. Um, you know, there's times where we're always praying for God to make changes in us, and, and it seems like those changes never take place. Um, so then we're always wondering, well, why is that? And, you know, and one of the things is, is that while the Holy Spirit has the power to transform us, God gave us the, the right of having free will, you know, the, the, the ability to make choices. So the Holy Spirit is not going to be that one that's going to say, you know what, I'm going to make you into this person that you want to be, because that's 
and total opposite of the whole great controversy, right? Because then that would have given Satan the possibility of saying, look, God, they're only serving you because you made them this way. You know, God wants us to serve him because we want to serve him. You know, I, I like the question that was actually um, posed in the lesson a little bit down on the page where it says, the spirit presents the truth about God and sin and then says, in view of what I've had shown you, what would you do now? You know, we, we, we have the option. We have a choice. And, and the Holy Spirit is not going to force us to do anything. But the Holy Spirit is there to guide us. It's there to help us. It will expose the truth. It will tell us the truth. It, it will tell us and we just need to listen. But we also have a choice that we need to make. You know, there was another quote in the in the day's lesson I thought was very possible. It said, um, very powerful, powerful rather. It says, it is the same when we are in the crucible. Sometimes the crucible is there precisely because we have not obeyed or repented of our sins. So sometimes we sit there wanting God to do something, but we're not doing something to work in partnership, which we're going to talk about a little bit later this week. So I'm going to turn it to the panel. What was your thoughts for Monday in terms of spirit of truth? You know, uh, again, I like the fact that the Holy Spirit is there as a helper. It brings the truth about our sinfulness, but it cannot, he cannot make us repent. The Holy Spirit cannot make us repent. We have to be able to make that decision and, and work in harmony with the Holy Spirit. But what was your thoughts for this lesson on Sunday in terms of the spirit of truth? I see smiling faces there. <laughs> For me, it was a tissue and a pause, you know, man, I think, um, you know, what hit me about this lesson on Sunday, Elder Curran panel and all those who are watching was, you know, the spirit of truth. And so, like, what is the spirit of truth? And so I think that um, I think all the time we struggle because we haven't reconciled. Like for us that were out there, sometimes for people, they have their own truths. And there lies the issue a lot of times is that, you know, if we're not really uh, connected to the truth, then, you know, it can make the struggle uh, unbearable and almost impossible. And I think that when the crew, and I think about the crucible being this place of change where change is, is taking place. And so then I think that, um, you know, one of the texts came to my mind was also in John. You know, because I think with us in our world, you know, we are people, we are, you know, spending time uh, trying to find our, find our way. You know, we're looking at um, learn the truth and also to have a good life. But in John 1, uh, 14, 6, Jesus says very clearly, he says, I am the way and the truth and the life. Then, you know, the, the verse finishes by saying no one comes to the Father except through me. So that text then for me, when we talk about the truth, is like if we're not really anchored in Christ, who is the truth and also the way, then it makes being in the crucible and actually surviving it, you know, I think uh, for many people are very impossible. So uh, those are some of the thoughts I had from the lesson uh, from that particular day, uh, thinking about, man, you know, how, how tough it is for many of us when we are being tested and, um, and when we put our human energies uh, solo into trying to uh, work things out. I heard a pastor say it like this: You know, which we are, we are, we are pressing, we are, we are pressing through with our own energy, and with our own energy that has limitations. And so then, uh, and if we're not connected to the truth, then what, which is revealed to us as the lesson talks about by the Holy Spirit, then uh, then we end up giving up. And so, so I just think it's important for me, and I think for those who are watching, to remember. That uh, whatever we're struggling with, you know, like what is your truth around that situation? You know, how you perceive that? Because we, with the wrong perception, you know, uh, we've been led down the wrong road. Right, right. Um, I guess I'll go next. The, you know, I think we have to ask ourselves: Do we really want the Holy Spirit? We say we want the Holy Spirit, but being filled with the Holy Spirit comes with other things. And Jose, I think you said this last week that, you know, sometimes we don't realize our own condition. And it's hard for us to be able to be in that naked state and be able to really see who we truly are. And that is what the goal of the Holy Spirit is. 
the Holy Spirit is going to guide us into truth. It's going to put us into that state of reality. It's going to reprove us of sin. And so we, we've got to really ask ourselves, do we want the Holy Spirit in the first place? And are we seeking for the Holy Spirit? The other thing I got from the lesson too was that, you know, when the Holy Spirit comes, we have to be willing to receive it. And again, it goes back to understanding our own true condition. You know, we've all probably heard that statement that says a closed mouth doesn't get fed, right? And so in order for us to receive something, we got to open our mouths. We got to open our hearts and we have to be willing to receive what the Holy Spirit is going to give us. The Holy Spirit is not going to knock us down. It's not going to put us in chains to make us do something, as was said earlier, so we have to open our hearts and our minds to be real, to be willing to receive what the Holy Spirit is going to give us. Yeah, I think, you know, to a certain extent, there is a little bit of a misunderstanding about the, the job of the Holy Spirit. Um, because I think for some of us, including myself, that we grow up thinking that the Holy Spirit is going to come in and then the Holy Spirit is going to make us do right. Like, I'm praying for this Holy Spirit. I'm waiting for this Holy Spirit, God, because when it comes, I, I'm not going to want to do that anymore. But the, according to the word of God, and I think it comes from a lack of studying the word of God, right? We spend a good amount of time, um, you know, in church, and that's so good, so good for the Christian life. But it's it's not active Bible study, you know? And so, but the word of God says that the job of the Holy Spirit is to, Reveal the truth about sin, convict us of sin, and reveal the truth about God. And so I like to think of the Holy Spirit like a traffic light. You know, you're, we'll get to this point where, and we might have a green, a green light that says, go, walk down this path. This is it. This is Jesus Christ. Follow him. But then at times the Holy Spirit will, will give us that red light. It's up to us whether we're going to pump the brakes. Mm -hmm. But we, we would be in a hard way without that traffic light. So we really need that traffic light, but we also have to recognize that we have to listen to the Holy Spirit. Um, and, and it's just a guiding light. It's it's not this force that's going to be walking for us or like moving our arm up and down. We have to really choose God after the Holy Spirit has shown us what that correct way is. Amen. Janelle, I love that analogy of the, the traffic light because um, <clears throat> some of us may be aware, you know, when you do that rolling stop and you make that turn on red, you know, you get that speed, that red light ticket. And yeah. it's the same thing here. You know, the, the Holy Spirit is telling us what we should be doing. It exposes the truth. It's our decision if we want to make that stop mm -hmm. or we're going to just kind of coast through. And then we get that ticket. That ticket maybe is the crucible. It may be the consequence of that decision of of not listening to the holy spirit mm -hmm. and, and in fact the the last sentence for the day on sunday actually says for the our father to work in such cases we must consciously choose to open the door of repentance and obedience in order for god's power to enter in and transform us i think christina mentioned earlier about sometimes it's, it's about how we view certain things you know we may be like, oh, God, make me a better person, transform me. But yet we may not necessarily look at sin the way that we need to. Or we may not necessarily think that we are doing something wrong. But yet we don't see the changes take place because the Holy Spirit is not being able to operate in us because we have not acknowledged, you know, our sinful state or us doing something that still is not pleasing to God. So good discussion on the power of truth for Sunday. Um, unless there's any other follow-up um, comments from our panelists, we're going to move to Monday, uh, turning it over to Janelle for the Divine Human Combination. All right. So, uh, you guys, we've already just been discussing this, that, you know, there is this combination of what God is going to do for us and then also what we're going to do, what we're going to do. And we have to stop minimizing our role in the divine human combination when it comes to becoming more like Christ. So that's the overcoming sin. Instead of you cussing at the, at the, in traffic, now you're just, you know, you're just smiling with your hand on the wheel, you know, actually becoming and looking more like Christ. That takes 
your effort. And it takes the Holy Spirit's effort. Um, and so Colossians 1.29, I just want to read that for you. It says, to this end, I also labor, striving according to his working, which works in me mightily. This is Paul talking. And he's saying that he's laboring, y'all. He's, he's saying that this thing is a hard thing. This is like, I'm going to work for my salvation and I'm not expecting that it's going to be easy. So let, let me encourage you all that if it hasn't been easy, hey, this was Paul's experience too, that he had to work hard. And But the, the difference between simply working hard and working in combination with the with what the divine spirit is that Paul wasn't working with what he had. He was working with God, what, with yes. what God already gave to him. So when we are striving to become more like Christ, when we're, when we're striving to grow in grace, we're not just working with what we've given ourselves. We're working with, with what God has already given to us. The reality is, is that God has given us what we need. Oh Lord, it's it's a lot in the bank account, but we haven't really cashed into that account because we're constantly thinking that we're insufficient, we're sinners, we need the Holy Spirit, and we do need the Holy Spirit, but we also have to recognize that God wants to partner with us. Um, a good a good example of this partnership is um, we know about Nike, we know about how popular the Nike brand is. But it becomes so different when you get someone like Serena Williams to put Nike on her shirt or for her to wear those, those skirts that got the swoop on it because they're combining the influence or the power of Serena Williams with this company brand. And now they're able to reach a whole different market. And Jesus recognizes the power that he, he's put in us. Y'all, we are made in the image of God that we are walking lights, right? And this partnership is required in order for us to move forward. So my question for you all is, why do you think we have believed for so long that God alone is going to do like this magical work in us and then we will get holy? Where do you think that that mindset has come from? I don't think that it's been said literally, but I think that a lot of us can believe that God is going to do all of this work and we just have to wait for him to do it. And then all of a sudden we'll start acting right. Where, where does that mindset come from? Well, I don't think it's just a church mindset. I think that we live in a society where people just want everything. They want it now. And we want it without putting the work. We think it just ought to come, right? Yeah. And so I take the example of losing weight because I have patients all the time who come in and say, can I get a pill for that? Um, is there some sort of surgery? Or is there something else that I can do for that? And of course, there are ways that we can aid things, but there, are, there is a work that we have to do. And sometimes God waits for us to take that first step, Dr. Howe. Sometimes he's saying that I'm going to give you power. We don't realize, like you said, the power that he's already put in us. And he's waiting for us to utilize that power first so that he can add to it and give us more power. I remember when I was a little kid and um, I got straight A's for the very first time. And uh, that summer, my dad gave me $250. Now, back then, which wasn't ancient, but it was some time ago, um, $250 for a kid during the summer was like a million dollars. It was a lot of money. Now, my dad didn't say, hey, look, I'm going to give you $250 during the summer if you do the work. I did the work, and then he blessed the work, and then that encouraged me to do more work. And that's what we have to do in the church. We have to, you know, many times we say, well, I'm going to pray, I'm going to pray, I'm going to pray. Well, we got to get up after that prayer and start working instead of waiting for God to do some miracle that might not happen until we get up and move. Mm, mm, mm -hmm. Man, that, those are great points, Christy. I'm, I'm glad your father gave you $250 in cash versus a savings fund because you'll still be waiting on that money. But, uh, you know, it, it, it is interesting. And what you said is absolutely true. It takes time and effort. You know, you mentioned about the example of, 
weight loss and somebody asking for a pill or a procedure. I mean, we live in a world of self-gratification and instant gratification. I want it now. In fact, in some cases, I wanted it yesterday, and you should have known that I wanted that. And, and it has definitely crept into not just our society, but even in, in the way that some people believe in, in their relationship with God. You know, the lesson was talking to, telling us how, you know, there's some evangelists that promise people that the Holy Spirit is just going to sit there and transform you, make you into this person. You know, you'll be able to do all these things without doing, putting in any work. You know, I, I like what it said at the end, you know, that it, it leads to half truths because people literally will believe that they're waiting on God to power to come while sitting comfortably in their in the pews in the church, sitting comfortably at home, watching it online, but not doing anything, anything that we want. It's going to take effort. It takes uh, time and, and our partnership with God, you know, the divine and the human, you know, we got to do our part. You know, there, there's nothing that's just going to be. Now, could God just literally make it happen? Sure. Absolutely. But, you know, Paul made it plain to us when he said he labored, he struggled, you know, to exhaustion. And he was struggling with the energy that God provided to him. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, we, we do live in a time where everybody just wants something for nothing. I think about um as a hiring manager, sometimes you get people who come in with no experience, but they want titles. They want large salaries, but they have nothing. They haven't done anything to justify that. And that's actually more now the norm than it is the exception. You see a lot of people asking for a lot of things that they haven't put the work in. So we, we definitely see that a lot more now. And the other thing that we see now is, is uh, I, can, I can only speak for my generation. My generation, we are not going to sit at a job that we don't like for long. So what was going on with our my generation? We quit. We quit after about nine to twelve months. We are out, and we listen. We then we get to the new job and realize, oh man, this one's not perfect either. And so we we just end up quitting. But the same thing with our relationship with God. I think that when we get to this point, we realize that it's not easy. We think, oh well, let's just give up now. Then we'll just try again. No, the struggle is a part of the Christian journey. Don't give up because it gets difficult. The name of the lesson is right. Struggling with all energy. You got to hold on. Right. Take the cross up on your back and don't let it off because it gets heavy. So I think, you know, that that's one thing that we're going that's going on in the Christian journey is that when we find ourselves really struggling with this thing, instead of saying, all right, I'm going to keep struggling. I'm not going to give up on myself. I'm not going to give up on Christ. We just drop the ball and say, no, I'm struggling. So I. I, I just haven't hit that mark yet, but that's that's not it. And we we have to remember that God can work through that struggle. Um, yeah. for, for, did, did anyone? Yeah, did, you know, you got the other part of it too. They, 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 don't, they, they don't give two weeks notice anymore either. They quit like on the spot. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> don't, you love, don't you love a millennial? Hey, Dr. Howe, real quick. Let me just, let me just chime in real quick. I want to, you know, tell me, I'll be brief. I promise I'll be brief. Yeah. You know, I think the, um, I think that, you know, we struggle because we are, we need to be rebranded. And so I think I love the Nike example because, you know, part of what we, part of our, part of our struggle is, you know, we are told, just mm -hmm. do it. Like, just do it. You don't, you know, it's just do it. And so, and we have done it. People have done it. I was just doing some research. And it's like, uh, people have demonstrated that they can do it. Right. Do what? You know, think about the time that we're living in. Um, some of the great feats of our time is, you know, electrification, automobiles, airplanes, you know, water supply distribution, electronics, radio, television, agriculture, you know, mechanism, computers, etc. And so people have them so they can do it. But then there's that point where, you know, uh, doing it for what reason? Paul says that he says in uh, first class in. Uh, this is 925. He said, and every man that strives for the mastery is tempered in all things. He said, now they do it to obtain a corrupt crown, but we for an incorrupt crown. And so I think that it's like, you know, you know, no matter what we do, there's a struggle. And then, you know, the last thing I would say is when I was in high school, uh, my senior year, we had a chance to go to the States. I'm the captain of the team and it's a, it's a mile relay. And all year I've been carrying the team. Like I'm coming, up, you know, you know, 20 meters to, to win race. I was tired. And so all we had to do is win fourth place and win state. I told the team, y'all feel like running? They said, no. I said, we're not running. The coach came to me and said, Jose, uh, he was a mean coach, but he knew my personality. He said, listen, if you, when you quit, it becomes easier the next time. Mm -hmm. 
So when we, we, we like leveling up, getting to that point where we can struggle and struggle and struggle in any circumstance, it just takes time and practice. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Practice that part. Yeah, so for Tuesday's lesson, it's called The Disciplined Will. And uh, again, a very great day. If you don't have the lesson, this is definitely one where I'm like, y'all, go, you got to go read this lesson right here. Uh, the Disciplined Will. And what it discusses is that we tend to put more weight on our feelings instead of our will, right? And once we will to do something, y'all, Man, remember, we're we're made in the image of God. When when God determined that he was going to save the human race, there was nothing that could keep him back. There was no Satan. There was no temptation. There was there was nothing. He decided that he's sending Jesus and Jesus decided that he's going to go through with it. That's the will, no matter how he was feeling. And many times we feel like we want to do it. We feel like we want to go have sex. We feel like we want to we want to watch this. We feel like we want to go do this. And, and guess what? We're human, right? Many of these desires are very natural, <laughs> by the way. But then we have to say, okay, God, my feelings have little to do with what you have willed me to do. My feelings have little to do with the will of God in my life. And so I, I like to think of it like, let's go back to the job situation. How many of us feel like going to work every day? Raise your hand if you feel like, Dr. Wells, I know you like your job. Do you feel like going every single day? What about you, Elder Curran? Does it, Wilson? Nobody? But y'all are baby, some of y'all are baby boomers. I thought you liked your job. What's going on? Don't you like your job? Yeah, I like my job. <laughs> not, not to that point. <laughs> Yeah, that don't mean I want to go every day. That don't mean I want to go every day. So if we're just going to be real, we love God, but let's just be honest. We don't want to do all that stuff he'd be asking us to do, y'all. Like, <laughs> we are we are human, right? The, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. So the, what the Bible says, but we still get up and go because we're committed. And so I think that we have to understand that one of the things that the Holy Spirit will help us do is to have that self-control. It's the fruit of the spirit, right? It's one of them. Just one of them is self-control. And we have to acknowledge that our feelings are natural. They're human. They're sinful, but they do not get to determine what we end up doing. They don't have that much power. It's our own will. Uh, my question um, for you all on the panel is, why do we give our feelings so much play? Why do we give our feelings so much value over what God is calling us to do when we don't really do that for a lot of other areas in our life? We, we know that we don't feel like going to work, but we still get up and go. Why do we do that in the Christian journey? Why do we give our feelings so much value? Man, I, I can start first because this lesson hurt my feelings when I when I got to it. Uh, <laughs> like because... It, it, you never really think about how much your feelings are impacting your decisions. I mean, it posed that question in there, and and my sister Christine is on this panel, and, and Cynthia is probably watching this. Like, what do I feel like eating for supper or for dinner? I don't know how many times we have said that in our lives. What do I feel like eating versus what should I be eating for for dinner and lunch? And I know Christine over there, like, yeah, uh, yeah, this this one got me. It, it got me because I was just like, it's true. I mean, we don't realize how much our feelings play a role in our decisions. And we, we don't think anything of it because we, we think it's a simple, non-dangerous thing. You know, what do I feel like eating? You know, and, and after a while, our feelings can deceive us. You know, we thinking like, like there's some stuff we'd be like, oh, I know I'm supposed to eat, you know, certain things. But it doesn't mean that the stuff that we are able to eat that we wouldn't overindulge or... For some of those of us who have other medical uh, issues, you know, maybe, you know, man, that Harold's is calling me. I'm pick on Harold's because I know that's been a topic over this panelist over some years. Um, you know, but is, is it the right thing? And that's on, on anything that we, we tend to do. You know, we, we can easily be deceived. And I think when you are your question about our spiritual journey, you're right. You know, there's things that we almost find ourselves justifying why we don't do. I mean, we, we know... There's the Ten Commandments. We know what God's laws are on certain things. But sometimes we may still be like, man, I feel like watching this movie. You know, I feel like 
doing something that I, I know I'm supposed to do. And it's just me, you know, nobody else will know. Not knowing that we're actually putting ourselves on that path where we're going to end up in a crucible that we created ourselves just because of our feelings. Yeah. Yeah, I think that uh, I'm not going to talk about food yet. I'm going to wait for my day. <laughs> but I think that when we, you know, our feelings, we want to give in to our feelings. We want to comfort our feelings. And so that comfort usually comes in ways that are not always so good for us. And so that's why we have to be able to have that discernment. Um, I wanna read the text that was in the lesson. It says, 1 Peter 1.13, um, and a couple of texts after it says, so prepare your minds for action and exercise self-control. Put all your hope in the gracious salvation that will come to you when Jesus Christ is revealed to you. So that you can live, so you must live as God's obedient children. The only way we're going to be able to do that is to exercise that self-control. And the more we exercise that self-control, then the easier it becomes. And the more we don't exercise the self-control, the easier it becomes to get back into that thing that we know we shouldn't be doing. But one of the things you said, see, so that I think also too is important is God has given us instruction. He's given us the word. He's given us his Ten Commandments and many other principles by which we could live. And so I've heard people say, um, I haven't been convicted by the Holy Spirit yet. And my, my answer to that is, well, that, what does the word say? If it says it in the word, is that not conviction enough? And of course, people put this to me when they talk about their diet. Right. Well, I haven't been convicted about that. Well, I'm like, well, what does the word say? That should be conviction enough. It says in 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture is inspired by God and is useful to teach us what is true and to make us realize what is wrong in our lives. It corrects us when we are wrong and teaches us to do what is right. And then James 1 to, uh, 22 says, but don't just listen to God's word. You must do what it says. Otherwise, you are only fooling yourselves. So sometimes we fool ourselves into thinking that the Holy Spirit needs to come and give us a personal invitation when the personal invitation is already there in the word. Yeah. Amen. A real quick fact check. Uh, that was 1 Corinthians 9.25. 1 Corinthians 9.25. When Paul talks about, you know, those who strive for those, ain't those, those corruptible crowns that we strive for those things that are uh, incorruptible. I think, uh, you know, thoughts and feeling drives behavior. And, you know, we get into a behavior pattern. It's like uh, we think if our thinking is distorted, then if we have the wrong, you know, and, and our thinking will be distorted. If we don't have the right understanding and right relationship who God is. And so then as the Holy Spirit is trying to communicate to us, uh, Jose, don't eat that. Now, at that point in time, I have a decision to make. Either I'm going to say, OK, um, is that something I should do when I've been informed otherwise? And if I say, well, I'm going to do it regardless man, I'm getting into a behavior pattern, right? And so then, and what happens is, we'll talk about this later on Thursday lesson, it's just hard to break those patterns, y'all. It's so like the reality of uh, panel and those who are watching, once we get into those behavior patterns, it's just hard to break those patterns. And so I think that's one of the, the, the greatest challenges we do have as Christians is, is one, when we see the, when, when the Holy Spirit says red light, now we know that that red light. I'm saying those of us who are those of us who know, we've been taught, we've been trained. Some people don't know that that red, that red light means stop. So like they're like babies and they just run through it. And so, but when they learn that you know something, um, even if I didn't know, I ran through that red light and I got hit by a car. You know, a life hit me. Then I know. Hopefully, I can be awakened to the reality that you know that's not something I need to do. When I see the red light, I need to stop. The danger is that when we know that reds mean stop and we decide, like we just, we, we make a conscious effort when we're being, and it's like, I, I feel like doing this, but I'm gonna do what I wanna do. So yeah. I think that I'm gonna challenge us cause this hit me too. This was, this was really an ouch lesson for me mm -hmm. because you know, the reality is we are doing what we wanna do. Yeah. You know, and so, and then if we, if we are, if we are really, curious to know about a situation when life presents a case, 
then we got to fact check. We got we got to check our feelings with God's word. Yeah. And so then and then and then by through discipline and time, we learn that the word would like, you know, something I feel like I really like this temporary satisfaction. I'm going to get for this thing that may feel good now. But God's word says, don't do this. And then in time, I learned that, oh, wow, I see. Thank you, Lord, for really taking over and allowing, working with me. It's humanity working with divinity to say, you know something? I see that this thing would have taken down the road with a lot of unnecessary negative consequences. Yeah. Yeah. And I, and I think last thing I'll say before we move on to Wednesday is that we got to also recognize that feelings are not bad, right? God has given us feelings and God has he, know, he knows how humans work. If I make this feel good, they're going to repeat it. That God is the one that created the brain. <laughs> All of these things that we feel. So we, we think about hunger. God has created this feeling of hunger to drive us to eat. God has created this feeling of fatigue and sleepiness to drive us to go lay down. God has created the sex drive to drive a husband and a wife together. So he's created all of these feelings. And we have this reward usually when we do those things that feel good and make us want to do it again. But I think for a lot of things in the Christian journey, we take the feel goodness out of it. If we do something right, we don't celebrate it at all. We keep it very secret. When we have one small win, no one knows about it. We don't celebrate that at all. But when in heaven, when one sinner repents, heaven rejoices. So this, there's this celebration that I believe should happen. And we need to put some feel goodness into the Christian journey or else it's going to be very hard to continue doing these behaviors that feel like no reward. Um, because we are human and we do have feelings. And I think we should try and find a way to use those feelings to our own advantage. Dr. How, feelings are not bad. That how real quick, you know, so I think so the challenge for us is that we, we need to learn that everything that's good doesn't feel good. Like everything that's good for us does not feel good for us at that time. You yeah. Know, and that's for, you know, athletes for studying. It's just not going to feel good every time. So and then in those other areas, we, we are learning to self-regulate and regulate. those. But, but I do feel that even in those other areas, let's say athletics or sports or even our job, there's always a reward. There's a paycheck. You know, when you're losing weight, you're getting to see the results. Like you're like, OK, I'm going to keep going to the gym. I'm looking better. But I think sometimes with our Christian journey, when we do something right or when we even make a small win, because we always thinking about this big, all right, I got to change so much. Well, what about that last night when you decided not to listen to that music? And, and I think that many times we don't acknowledge or really celebrate that when, when God is working in us. And yeah. so we, we don't get to experience that, that celebratory feeling that I, I think makes it a little bit difficult to continue doing something when we don't yes. get any of those yeah. endorphins. Yes, indeed. But but let's go ahead and move on. We're moving on to, uh, unless Dr. Wells or Elder Curran, you had anything else to say? Well, as, I'll say something as I move on to Wednesday. Okay. And uh, I, I agree with the, both of what you guys said. God has given us pleasure, right? He we Those things are an aid in us, but we it must be our pleasure seeking must be contained and confined with the will of God and what the word says. Otherwise, it's going to lead us to more crucibles, more consequences that we don't want. But I also agree with Jose that, you know, when I'm riding my bike, that's a struggle. I'm not feeling good while I'm riding it. But again, Dr. Howe, when I get off and I see what happens, I, when I get off that bike, though, I feel good. Yeah. But while I'm doing it, I'm like, oh, I can't make it through this. So I think we have to understand both sides of that story. So as we move on to Wednesday, radical commitment, I said, oh, wow, this lesson is definitely great for me. So um, I first wanted to start off, I have a few points, but I wanted to start off with what the lesson brings out about how do we stray from God? And it's one step at a time. It's not that we're usually taking some big leap. But it's that one little thing that we listen to, that one little person that we're hanging out with that we shouldn't be hanging out with. And then we find ourselves doing things that we never imagined that we would do before. There's this Chinese proverb that says, watch your thoughts, they become your words. Watch your words, they become your actions. Watch your actions, they become your habits. Watch your habits, they become your character. Watch your character, it becomes your destiny. So we have to start with what we put in 
to our minds. And that leads me to the first point. We have got to guard the avenues of the soul. And what is that? That's the mind. And that is where Satan is going to attack us first. The mind then, <clears throat> excuse me, is impacted by what? Our five senses. What we see, what we hear, what we feel, what we touch, and what we taste. And all of those need to be guarded because if not, then we're going to find ourselves in situations that we didn't necessarily intend to be in. And how do we guard our minds? You know, we've got to be mindful of what we're taking in. Because if our minds aren't clear, then we're not going to be able to hear the Holy Spirit convicting us of truth and guiding us in the way we should go. You know, you got now here I'm going to bring in my health thing, right? Because we know that the you gut. Are it, girl. You <laughs> are it. The gut and the brain are intimately connected. What you eat impacts how you think and how you feel. And so if you're eating sweets all the time, if we're eating things that we shouldn't be eating, then it's going to impact our feelings. It's going to impact how we seek comfort, how we seek pleasure. It's going to impact the decisions that we make. And so it's important that what we put in our gut is going to be productive and it's going to produce an environment that's going to allow us to have a clear mind and help us to make clear decisions and have and not be so based on our feelings or not to say that we're not based on our feelings, but that our feelings are based and in the word of God. The second point I want to bring out quickly is that God doesn't always remove the temptation. Instead, he provides a way of escape. But we also must be willing to not put ourselves into um, the area of temptation. So um, there's this medication that I give out called Vivitrol, and it helps people who are struggling with alcohol addiction to be able to reduce their cravings so that they don't want to drink. So I had a patient come in this week, and he was coming in for his injection for Vivitrol, and he said, oh, he was doing really, really good on the Vivitrol. He says, I can even still go to the liquor store without temptation. And I was like, no, no, you don't want to do that. What's going to happen when you get off this medicine and you go to the liquor store? That's a temptation you don't want to have. And so it's like just remove. Sometimes we put ourselves in the path of temptation. And we have to remember that we have to be mindful that we don't want to put ourselves there because sometimes the devil is stronger than what we think we are. And so without that power of God working through us and in us, we're going to find ourselves falling into temptation because we put ourselves there. My third point is also God is calling us now to a radical commitment in every aspect of our lives. But that radical commitment is first a personal one, and then it extends to our work in the church. We have to ask ourselves, why don't we see things changing in our own lives and in the church? And I think that's because we've been okay with where we're at. We're okay with the status quo. We're okay with mediocrity. We don't, we're waiting for, again, for God to perform some miracle when he's told us that we need to get up and do the work. And so my question to the panel, I know I ran through that fast, but my question to the panel is, what radical commitment have you made or do you feel that God is calling you to make? Well, I'll start first on that because as my dear sister talked about health stuff and what our gut and our mind is all connected. Again, I'm getting convicted again. Um, I know for me, a radical commitment probably would be a dietary change. Um, you know, there are some things that I'm going through medically that probably would be better um, if there's some changes that I could make. And, and, you know, the lesson even talked about things just don't happen immediately. It, it's, you know, we, we drift away in some things, and even spirituality, you know, one step at a time, one day at a time. And it's the same thing when we want to do something that's going to be radical, that's going to be different. You know, it won't be in the media switch on, you know, the, the phrase something cold turkey, um, which is still good, Christina. But, you know, it, it is a case, though, where it's going to it's going to require commitment, but it's going to take time. You know, it's a step at a time. So for me, something like that would be um, a radical commitment. But, you know, there was something else in, in 
this lesson that I, I liked. It actually mentioned that God sometimes uses crucibles to catch our attention when there are so many noisy distractions around us. If we think about a couple of weeks ago, we had a lesson called Bird Cage. Uh, and in that lesson, it talked about how sometimes that owner of the bird would put a cover over the cage, move the cage and put it somewhere that it will that bird would be less distracted in order to learn the song that the bird owner was trying to teach him or her. Um, it's the same thing for us. You know, God may have to move us, you know, and it may be a radical thing that move that that's there, but it, it reduces distraction. I think in our in our chat here, I think Elder Martin mentioned that, too. He had distractions as a word, you know, and, and this lesson for this week has just been wonderful because it's all been connected. You know, we were talking about how, um, you know, there's that the divine and the human part. We we're talking about the spirit of truth, the, the helper. And now here we are with this radical commitment. Everything is, is interlocked together. And, and, you know, Jesus used a very strong example of talking about, hey, take your eye out if you have to be. If that's going to cause you to stumble and, and, and go into the kingdom of heaven with an eye missing versus having your entire body, you know, committed into hell. So, you know, it's it's radical. It's, it's, you know, some people may think that that's actually literal, but it's just showing the type of commitment and control that we need over our bodies and our minds. Powerful, man. Yeah, and I think um, I love that part of the lesson when it talks about that radical, the radical change, man. I think, um, you know, it's difficult to think about making us so to the question for me it's it's a couple things uh, one you know i felt inspired to to do this bike ride I, you, know, you guys have heard about you know from london to paris and so uh that was that whole process was completely radical you know and so uh and so many people you know uh, upon complete have been you know uh blessed in that uh, by the by the experience uh especially myself but i do think when we think about those radical changes i think about when i was um you know graduating uh, college and went back to hang out with my old friend you know god had took, took control of my life and i was not doing some of the things i was doing before and uh my, my best friend growing up put me in a very compromising situation and so um i had a family at this time and i looked at him and i'm like mm -mm, i cut him off i mean i just i just i just cut him off for 10 years and so um and so what happened is that the text you just quoted elder Curran. so what happens is man on the other side of what, we, what we're trying to get and what we're striving to get to those radical so it's not so it's not a literal puck in your eye out but what one the illustration i think demonstrate and allude to there's going to be some pain in the separation so like you know when we make those radical shifts there's going to be some pain in separation but then learning to endure that pain or that suffering you know as part of the experience becomes a part of that whole process and it draws us closer to christ because i, I think for me you know, in those both illustrations, when I when I decided to let my friend go because he was he was living a different lifestyle and put me in harm's way, that's my family harm's way. I love him. I mean, we were we were ride and die in high school, but I cut him loose for ten years. And when I knew that he was safe to be around again, that's when we connected. And so, uh, and also that experience to travel from uh, you know London to Paris, man, that was very difficult. You know, but enduring that pain, knowing that. You know, on the other side of that, that was a great benefit. And so those couple examples. Yeah, I'll say for me, I think God's calling me radical commitment to a financial commitment um, to God. And not just tithes and offering, but just using more of my resources to bless other people. You know, the Bible says that where your treasure is, that's where your heart is. And uh, I think I think God has has been calling me there for a while now. Um, another area I would say is social commitment. I think that, you know, in this age, you don't want to offend a lot of people. So you might tend to kind of coat your message or say certain things because you don't want to cause an uproar. But I think, you know, God has, when God has shown you something, you have, an, you have the responsibility now. Look, when you learn about Christ, you got to share it. So I, I think that socially God is calling me to be more open with my faith more. Um, so definitely in those two areas, uh, financially and just, you know, when it comes to my social networks. 
Wonderful, wonderful. I'm going to say this and pass it on to, to uh, Wilson. What you said, Dr. Hal, is key. When you become, when you learn about something, then you've got to share that. And what we don't do, I think personally and in the church, is share what we've been given. For me, if you know me, you know I'm about health, right? I can't sit back and not share what I've been given. And I think if we all take that energy, that radical commitment to just share what the Lord has given you, then we can all change the world one person at a time. Amen. So I'm going to pass this on to Elder Wilson. Dr. Wells, were you at Chicago Home and Chicken and Waffles last week? <laughs> I thought I saw someone that looked like you. But that wasn't me. Okay. Okay. <laughs> yeah, man. Amen. Amen. You know, the waffles are good. You know. <laughs> right. Ain't nothing wrong with the waffles. Put a little honey on top. Don't you? Some oh, yeah, strawberries. <laughs> wow. So Thursday lesson, Thursday lesson, we're dealing with uh, the need to persevere, man, the need to persevere. And so a great study, you know, when we think about the life of uh, Jacob and, you know, we are, uh, you know, not too long ago, we just went through the whole life of Jacob and what he went through. And, you know, he got, you know, took his uh, brother's birth, birthright, you know, uh, although he was a chosen one, you know, Esau. And so uh, as he was fleeing, you know, we know that Jacob sees a ladder, you know, going from heaven to earth and, and what that represents. And so as he's as time goes by, you know, he has expands his family. And so Jacob now is heading to meet his brother. And so he struggles with he struggled with the Savior. You know, he struggles. And so I think that's one of the most powerful examples. When we think about the struggle, uh, one of the things that came across for me was reminded how, you know, Dr. How you know, as we share truth, I've learned to try to, I've asked the Holy Spirit, Dr. Wells, Elder Kern, to give me truth and share like Christ did. He would share truth, we're told in the spirit of Christ. His voice is trembling, man, because it's like, you need to hear this, because it's to your eternal life, your, your eternal life is dependent on it. So he struggled, to, he was not going to let that angel, that Christ go until he got blessed. It's even, even though, so we talk about persevering. So it's one thing that we get, I think that level of persevering. So what we see here is the, the, the kind of perseverance that we need to be able to make it over. And so it's like, you know, at least developing that type of perseverance. I don't think sometimes we come into the faith when we're babes, we may not have that at that time, but really developing that perseverance where we're like, I'm going to grab you and Lord, I'm going to hold on to you until you bless me. And so a lot of us are dealing with different factors and issues that we need to have victory over. And I think you said it earlier, Dr. Howe, but we're not struggling long enough. Like what happens is once it gets hard, you know, we let go. And so it was, the reality is that hard for you, Dr. Well, may not, may be impossible right now for me. And, and Elder Kern and, and, and Dr. Howe, so what happens, y'all, we're not saying we're the same, but it's like, but learning to struggle and get to that point where it's a matter of life and death. Well, I think once we make that commitment and we hit that point in our, in, our, in, our, in our spiritual growth, then I believe now we know that we can't do it alone. So now the human agency then, you know, uh, connects with the divine agency, the Holy Spirit. And then we get those, we then we can struggle, we hang in there and we're able to get victory over stuff that's, that's, that began in the sin that kind of keeps us. So what do y'all think? Because I think for me, um, you know, I was going to share a story about Napoleon and he was going on this journey to conquer this, this, this new world. And when he got to his land, he burnt all of his ships. And he was outnumbered 10 to 1. And he did it because he wanted to make sure that his soldier knew that there was no retreat. And I think that when we feel like we can retreat back, like we don't, we're not all in. Then, you know, we have opportunity to leave avenues open, Dr. Wells, for sin to get in through our senses. So. What are y'all thoughts, panel, just about, you know, the need to persevere? And the reality is that sometimes, it's, oftentimes, it's very difficult to persevere to that level that Jacob went through. You know, I think it's, this was another, another good lesson as well. Um, it, it's tough to do the right thing when there's no pressure. Imagine then when you have pressure added to it. 
not only is it tough to do the right thing, but it's also difficult to keep, keep holding on to God's promises. You know, we had the whole quarterly on the book of Genesis, um, the Sabbath school lesson on the last quarter, and we, we went into depth about Jacob, you know, and, and, and that fight and some of the stuff that Jacob did, you know, and, and Jacob was deceitful, you know, and after a while he was fearful and concerned about some of the decisions he made, things that he did. He was wondering if they're going to come back and get him, you know, um, and despite God's promises to him, God's blessing, he still was fearful. And, and you know, for so when at this point now, when he's wrestling Jesus, for the most part, you know, he's fighting with all his strength and all his might. Get that hip touched. Now he's fighting to hold on. And, and, and that's where we, we, we find ourselves sometimes. You know, God may have to kind of touch our hip. And, you know, we, we go through some stuff. And we, we need to push through the pain, but it's at that point, though, where we get that blessing. And, and perseverance is not an easy thing. I mean, we, we want to give up at times. We're, we're tired. You know, we're, we're, we're exhausted. We're beat. But this is where now that, that, that abundant energy that God can only provide comes into play. But we're holding on because of what he has given to us. It's not in our own strength anymore. It, it's, it's his strength. His, his energy that helps us to get through, but it doesn't mean that we don't get the pain. Um, yeah. You know, I, I think of a wrestler, you know, um, in, in high school, you know, we all used to wrestle. After a while, especially if you were wrestling somebody who, even though you're in the same weight class, they might be a little bit stronger or you're tired at this point. You're doing everything you can to wear that clock out. And so you, you hold on, you know, and you're still struggling. You have nothing left in the tank, but you, you never know what the result may be. Just even finishing that match it, it could be a win, you know, versus taking the loss. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you, Cecil. You know, thoughts about that real quick? I was just going to say quickly that sometimes all we can do is keep moving while we're hanging on to Jesus. I know that we pr probably all can think of an, something in our lives that we did maybe mm -hmm. out of feelings that we know we should not have done and then created consequences that we're still dealing with now. And so we have to, no matter what has happened to us, continue to persevere and even continue in that struggle, but with Christ. You know, the, the lesson says that Jacob was still limping when he met his brother. And so there was a consequence from his struggle. However, he saw that consequence as something good, right? Consequences don't always have to be bad. They can be things that help us to grow, things that help us to progress, and, and things that are character building. So no matter what we're going through, we need to persevere. I just want to read this, this um, verse in Galatians 6, 9. It says, and let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. Amen. Amen. Yeah, I, I think that, you know, there's so many things that we can continue to learn and study about this, this topic. It is just rich. But, you know, I, I would encourage myself and everyone just hold on to Christ because we can logically try to think through this thing. But, man, we need a divine help to do this. And so stay in constant communion with Christ, you know, at the if you go in your text messages, you have the people who you always talk to, probably about three people that are at the top of your text list. And then you got to scroll for certain people. Make sure Christ is at that top. You talk to him. And I'm talking about outside of right before you eat and outside of during church. Get in that communication with Christ. That's your saving grace. You got to stay in close with Jesus. He's the ultimate plug, the ultimate connection. So keep that in mind, no matter where you are in your journey, whether you feel like you're struggling a lot right now or whether you're not, we all need Jesus Christ. Uh, stay close to him. And I think that we all going to be OK. Amen. Amen. Uh, I listen, I think as I wrap this up uh, for Thursday and Friday, uh, Jacob's story is encouraging because uh, Jacob, Jacob calls that crucible with his brother. Like, but God still showed up for him. God still demonstrated his love for him. God still followed through on his promise uh, to Jacob. Jacob just hadn't settled that yet. So that, that struggle was really about that. Lord, okay, I know you, you're you still with me, but God confirmed. So I think for those of us who are struggling, those of us who may cause the crucible that we're in, 
uh, Jacob's story is a reminder that God is still with us. And to Dr. Powell's point as well, just continue to hold on to Christ because you will get through it, but don't let him go. Mm -hmm. Dr. Curran? All right. Wonderful lesson for this week. Again, struggling with all energy. Um, I'm going to give the panel 15 seconds each just for your, your final wrap up comments uh, since we're, we're, we're kind of out of time here. So um, I will start with uh, Dr. Howe, your final comments for this week's lesson. If you're still eating chicken, it's OK. Just know that Jesus loves you, okay? He really, really does. I know we've been convicted on this lesson here today. But, uh, where, wherever you are, let that be known that Jesus doesn't just love you. He likes you. Ooh, he likes you. He, he's way, He's like, dang, I hope she reaches out to me today. So just remember that, that, that God actually really enjoys when you reach out to him. So so don't neglect to make that, that call or that text to, to God. All right, amen, amen. All right, I, got, I need to go next. <laughs> so let me let me say this: if you're still struggling with chicken or any other dietary or any anything else in your life, I want to read this from Friday, from Friday's lessons. It says, "Many never attain to the position they might occupy because they wait for God to do for them that which He has given them power." to do for themselves. All who are fitted for usefulness must be trained by the severest mental and moral discipline, and God will assist them by divide, by uniting divine power with human effort. We've got to make these radical changes, whether it's chicken or something <laughs> else, and believe that God will give us the power to do it. Amen. But if you're gonna eat chicken, <laughs> make, sure the blood, make sure the blood's not in it. We never want to eat it. <laughs> oh, man. Elder Wilson. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I'm jumping right on in. I'm jumping right on in. <laughs> so Elder Wells, Elder Wells um, just sent a text to me. He says, our challenges can make us stronger and increase our faith. And I agree with that 100%. Listen, y'all, wherever you are in your struggle, please know this. Above all things, know that God loves you. Like, he loves you wherever you are in that battle, whether you have with the surrendering and discipline, you have the ability through the Holy Spirit to um, overcome whatever you're dealing with. Yeah. Like it's not an excuse to stay there. Right. It's just not an excuse to stay there. We have we have promises that God has made to us mm -hmm. that we have power. Now He didn't say life's gonna be easy for us. We did say I will never leave nor forsake you. So hang in there. Hang in there. Amen. And then my final comment on this is just again. You know, it, the lesson just talked about so much. This was a very powerful lesson. But I was thinking about what Peter said in First Peter chapter 1, verse 10, 13, telling us to be sober in mind. You know, in other words, let, let us have control of our minds, which will help us to have control of our feelings and of our will, providing us what we need in order to, again, to continue to struggle with all energy, all the energy that God has equipped us with, in order to survive the crucible. So again, thank you panel for joining us uh, this week. Thank you those who are watching online for your comments and your interaction as well. Um, we, we look forward to next week's lesson and, and the panel that's gonna be um, providing that for us as well. I just wanna give a friendly reminder that we will have divine worship starting in the sanctuary in person. If you haven't been in person yet, here's an opportunity to join us. The weather is nice, come on out. Um, we do understand for some you can't make it in person, so we will be streaming online on Shiloh's YouTube page. So feel free to join us and join the chat, interact with us. Um, but again, we, we look forward to speaking and seeing with you soon. And at this point, I am going to ask uh, Dr. Wells, would you mind closing us out in prayer? Amen. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord God, thank you for this Sabbath day. Thank you for the Holy Spirit dear God, that guides us into all truth. Lord God, give us your wisdom, give us your guidance. Help us, dear God, to be wanting to have a radical change in our own personal lives so then that radical change can extend to the church and our communities. God, move us forward so that we can be the lights in this world that you have called us to be. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. 
Amen. Hold it on, even if you're only holding on by a chicken wing. <laughs> <laughs> Bye, you guys. All right. See you, everybody.